Paladin Oaths are a huge part of the class, mainly because they also act as your subclass, but they're also the guiding tenets by which your character must adhere. In this video today, we're going to break apart the four oaths for Paladin to help you decide which is best for you in your playthrough. We'll go through each one of the oaths, breaking down the abilities you get, then discuss what playstyle the oath applies to so that you can help create the ideal Paladin for your party composition, or even respec one of your companions to said oath. If this is your first time on my channel, the way I do things here is by upfronting the knowledge of my video videos so you can decide if it's the right one for you. So with that being said, there is no best oath. It comes down to the paladin you want to create. So if we're talking pure damage, Oathbreaker is probably the best because of Aura of Hate, granting plus five damage to the paladin at max charisma, as well as to undead around them. If you want to focus purely on your own damage and not buff the party, then the Oath of Vengeance grants you a lot of advantage rolls and mobility towards hunting down individual targets. The Oath of Ancients is also great due to its dedicated spells that crowd control and damage, such as Moonbeam, so you can smash enemies apart coupled with their amazing healing abilities. Conversely, if you want to focus on being a tank with reactive damage and a lot of party defensive utility, then the Oath of Devotion gives you the best abilities to do so, but does lack in any real damage capabilities outside of the kind of innate ones you get as a paladin. But that's it. That's the TLDR of this entire video. So if that's all you wanted to know and you have a better idea now of the paladin you want to create, then please feel free to shut the video down. But before you do, please don't forget to subscribe, comment, or like the video. 86% of my viewer base is unsubscribed, so I'm trying to change that metric this year and every little bit helps. You can jump ahead to any part of this video that interests you the most using the chapters in both the timeline and the description. And if you need help with any other of the uh, Baldur's Gate 3 subject matter, you can find a link link to my entire BG3 playlist below, as well as a link to my Twitch where I stream Baldur's Gate and a number of other games. Let's get started here on the best Paladin Oath in Baldur's Gate 3. So to start us off, we're going to talk about the general Paladin abilities you get so that you understand the base package that comes with you regardless of your subclass or your Oath decision, right? So just taking a look at level 1, we get Divine Sense, which is going to give us um, advantage when we're attacking fiends, undead, pretty much things that are unholy. Uh, we get Lay on Hands, which is going to be a heal that is based off of, it's like it's 10 plus your Paladin level, I believe. So if you're level 12, it's 22 level uh, uh, points of healing. Channel Oath is going to be respective to your, your individual Oath you've decided upon. Basically, this is going to enable you to have a special ability like Holy uh, Rebuke for Oath of Devotion and so on and so forth. You'll choose your subclass as well. That's all done at level 1. Level 2, you get your fighting style, stuff like um, Great Weapon Fighting, Protection, uh, dueling, stuff like that. Your ability to spell cast unlocks level two. You'll get Divine Smite, which is a spell. And this is going to give you 2d8 radiant damage. And then for, and it's a level one spell slot. For every spell slot you use above level one, you're going to get an additional 1d8. And with improved Divine Smite, you automatically get uh, that 1d8 right out the gate. So you're going to be uh, basically just using level one spell slot is, uh, 3d8. If I, let's see if I got that right. Um, and we're using the BG3 wiki here because it just has so much information you can jump into. Yes, yeah, so your weapon emanates divine might as you strike, dealing an additional 2d8 radiant damage and deals an additional 1d8 radiant damage to fiends and undead. And per level slot you use will grant you an additional 1d8. And then, like I said before, once you get to improve radiant strike, this will just base do 3d8 radiant damage, which is really, really lovely. You'll get Divine Health here, which is going to make it so that you are immune to disease. You'll get your feet. You'll get your extra attack, which means that every time you do a base attack, you'll get an ad additional attack within it. You'll get your Aura of Protection, and you'll get your Aura of Courage. Now, Aura of, aura of Courage here is going to help you out whenever you're dealing with... Um, uh, the ability to be frightened, it's going to make it so that all of your allies cannot be uh, feared. And uh, your aura protection here, passive feature that improves the paladin and all nearby saving throws. So your saving throw is increased based off of your charisma modifier. So if you have, let's just say, 18 charisma, then you're going to take, you know, plus four charisma to every, or I'm sorry, plus four saving throw to everyone's saving throw if they're within the range of your aura, which I believe is like 30 feet. And anytime you see subclass feature, this is a subclass feature that's going to apply to whichever one of these oaths you choose, um, all the way down here to improve Divine Smite, that'll add 11, and your final 
speed at level 12. So these are just the basing that you get. I wanted to quickly outline them before we jump into the individual oaths, but this is important to note. It's also important to note too, when you get access to your respective level of spell. So you start with first level spells at level two, you'll get access to your second level spell at level five, and you'll get access to your third level spell at level eight. And you have lay on hand charges that increase here to from three to four, all the way down to five at level 10, 11, and 12. So just some basings to know before we jump into our individual classes. So the first oath we're gonna talk about is the Oath of the Ancients. And it kind of sits in the middle between outright damage and party utility and support. I think it's probably one of the strongest oaths, even though it seems like it might be kind of a little bit more on the boring side, because you are this, this holy warrior of nature and less the kind of prototypical paladin that you are of maybe the Oath of Devotion. And the biggest thing that you're gonna take advantage of here is your lay on hands, of course, but, oh, it's right here, there it is, healing radiance. So heal yourself and all nearby allies for six, hit points. Regain another six hit points next turn. So why this is a very important one is if you look at this on paper, you're like, that doesn't do much, dude. What is this? What's the point of this? There's a formula for what the amount of hit points you get here are. It's proficiency bonus plus your paladin level plus your charisma modifier. That is the recipe here. So that's plus three for my charisma modifier, right? Then another plus one because we're level one paladin. That brings us up to four. And then our Proficiency bonus is two since we're at level one right now. This gives us six hit points. So ideally, towards the end of the game, what you would want here, you'd get your base 12 from being a level 12 paladin. You'd get your four from having a proficiency bonus of four, which you'll have at level 12. It just innately increases, right? So that right there is 16 hit points. And then your charisma modifier, depending upon where you bring your charisma, it's pretty easy to get charisma to 20. So let's assume that's a plus five there. So you have 21 just free hit points that you're dealing out. So heal yourself and all kneel by allies for 21 hit points and then regain another 21 hit points next turn. So if you're redlining it, the Oath of the Ancients allows you to get a ton of health online quickly. At level three here for Oath of Ancients, we're gonna get access to Ensnaring Strike and Speak with Animals. Two abilities that aren't necessarily very amazing. This has Ensnaring Strike range, but you can do either ranged or melee, it doesn't matter. And you do get the action here of Nature's Wrath. So invoke primeval forces to restrain an enemy. It can't move, misses a lot, and is easy to hit. Why this is so good here is that your attack rolls against the affected entity have advantage, while the entity's attack rolls and dexterity saving throws have disadvantage. So this is a really great way to lock something down. And in addition to, you get Divine Health. Uh, this is just from your class, sorry. Uh, you get Turn the Faithless, Turn nearby Fae and Fiends. They are forced to flee and cannot come close to you. Now, this isn't amazing since it is a, these are, this is a channel oath charge. Um, Nature's Wrath, though, is very nice to be able to lock things down and be able to do some damage to them. Now, keep in mind, though, Oath spells are spells that are always prepared. You don't have to kind of push them into this prepared spell list. It's always active for you. That's true for all of our Paladin Oaths going forward. So let's jump down to level five and see some more progression for this. And just like everything else in the game, level five is when you get a really good power spike with the Oath of Ancients in Misty Step, which is a bonus action. So this is gonna allow you to move anywhere you want within 60 feet. It's a huge mobility increase in both the Oath of Vengeance and the Oath of Ancients get this, but Moonbeam is just disgustingly strong. You couple this too with the radiant damage that you can do from your Divine Smite, it's very, very good. Call down a beam of light that damages any creature that enters the beam or starts its turn in the, beam, in the light. You can use an action to move the beam 60 feet. It does require concentration. Hopefully you'll have a good enough amount of concentration to maintain that, but it's a really, 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 really strong ability. And of course, level five, this is regardless of your oath, but you still get extra attack. So these things kind of all come together to make for a very strong showing of level five for the Oath of Ancients. And at level seven for Oath of Ancients, we're gonna unlock Aura of Warding here. So this is a really strong defensive capability. You and nearby allies take only half the damage from spells. The aura disappears if you fall unconscious, of course, but you just got the defensive aura that increases the saving throws of everyone around you based off your charisma modifier in the level prior to this. So you add a lot of defensive capability you now have some good offensive capability across your extra attack, your Moonbeam characteristic, and your Divine Smite, and you have some healing that the um, that the Oath of Ancients pours on. It really allows you to do quite a bit here. So let's jump to our last break at level 9. 
and that grants us two oath spells protection from energy so touch a creature to grant it resistance to acid cold fire lightning or thunder damage and then plant growth make weeds burst from the ground and smother the area creatures moving through the weeds have their movement speed quartered so it allows you to do a little bit of cc here at the cost of level three spell slot so these are some of the things that make the ancient quite good but let's put them all together taking a look at our character here we have our three auras right our aura of protection and then we have our aura of warding and then we have our aura of courage so right off the gate we get these three auras active and before i jump into combat what i want you to really look at with the paladin and something that is super important and i've deliberately done my spell book like this so that you can see this you need to really be mindful of your spells. And this is going to be true of any of the subclasses you choose because the Paladin has a lot of concentration abilities. It's why the Warcaster feat is quite good for them because it gives them an advantage on concentration rolls and having a high amount of concentration is going to help. So take a look at Branding Smite. Oh, sick. It's so all this damage. Possibly marks your target with light, preventing it from turning invisible. Concentration. Magic weapon. Oh, man, I get to increase all this stuff concentration bless oh, i'll get to increase my bonus attack rolls and saving throws concentration so you really need to look at all these because almost all of them not all of them but almost all of them will have a concentration not penalty but a cost attached to it elemental weapon is a concentration ability moonbeam which i talked about is really good and disgustingly strong is a concentration ability same th oh no nature wrath is not uh, a blinding smite there is not i thought it was though um but protection from energy which is one of our um our oath spells is a concentration spell so keep these things in mind before you jump into fights and think i'm just going to be casting all these spells and going completely hot ass wild it is not like that you need to be clever about things because remember only one concentration spell can be active and you'll shut off the previous one and waste a spell slot if you do that so jumping into this fight, I've kind of set things up a little bit here so it can show some things off. Now, I've got some options, right? Now, Karlak is in a little bit of a pinch here. I could have gone over here and used my healing ability with my healing radiance, which you can see does 17 plus an additional 17 next turn. Uh, unfortunately, I used my bonus action, though. So let's go ahead, though, and still show off what we can do by coming over here. And let's go ahead and use Moonbeam down first. I'm going to cast that right there. This is one of our, our bound abilities, right? This is one of our oath spells. We're going to come up close, and I can use Nature's Wrath to restrain her, but we can also just kind of go hard in the paint with the good Divine Smite. We've got our Elemental Weapon for if I want to buff myself up, but I don't really want to do that. And then on my turn, I can move this move beam, uh, this moon beam. If you do not know you could do that, you can do that. I do have Grand Slam as part of that weapon. That's not part of the class. So we talked about Divine Smite, 22 to 49. We put another spell level into it. It goes 23 to 57. We put another spell level into it. It goes 24, 65. And this does have a 45% chance to hit. If I go ahead and shut this off, I'll probably be a better chance to hit. Let me try that again now. Yeah, 70%. This way it might show the damage. And we have, you need an 18, they rolled us 26. There we go. We crit hit with it and did a bunch of slamming. And we did 6, 0, and 19. And we can go ahead and just chain this into another one if we so wish because of extra attack. Now that's not something necessarily very unique to the Oath of Ancients. But it's just another way to kind of show you how you can pair up a lot of the damage capabilities of Ancients with also having the capability to help out with anything around. Now I did cast these auras um, while I was in camp, but had I ran over here and cast Aura of Courage, I would have been able to help out Karlak to prevent her from getting frightened. Let's go a little bit further forward. Now jumping back into this fight a little bit, we can use this Moonbeam to cost us an action but i do want to show this off really quick healing radiance we are just about out of range there so let's go right here healing radiance and we'll be able to get karlak in on this because she's down to 38 health it's going to give her a little bit of health i still have plenty of damage utility except two more actions we're going to move this moonbeam just a little bit now to get both of these targets so we just have so much we can do with this character right and what i really like too is just how much utility paladins bring to the table, which is always very fun. I'll just do this for dramatic emphasis. Boom. 
So, a lot of fun that can be had with the Oath of Ancients, and it's one that's definitely a damage-dealing version of the Paladin, but at the same time, a utility one that helps with defense and helps with healing. It's time now for the quintessential Paladin with the Oath of Devotion. So, if Oath of the Ancients is kind of that striking of a middle ground between utility and offense, Oath of Devotion is really geared towards, not even necessarily utility, but, str but strongly towards defense with some utility options built in. Your initial action is Holy Rebuke, and opinion here, I think Holy Rebuke is unfortunately very weak because it never scales away from 1 to 4 radiant damage. If this eventually became uh, instead of 1d4, 2d4, then eventually 3d4 based off of your level or something like that, I think it'd be really good. But right now, grant an ally a ventral aura that deals 1 to 4 radiant damage to anyone who hits them with a melee attack. It's two turns, and it casts. It costs you a channel oath charge and an action. So Holy Rebuke is really not that worth it. But there are portions of the Oath of Devotion that are worth it. So let's kind of look at the forward or the future of what this oath looks like. At level three, we get one of those actions that I was talking about, and it is Sacred Weapon. So what you're doing is you're using your channel oath this time, and I do wish that this was a bonus action rather than an action, but you turn your weapon into a sacred weapon, meaning that you now use your charisma modifier. My current charisma modifier is a three, and you add it to your attack roll. Remember, attack roll is not your damage. This is the ability, or this is the, um, the likelihood in which you'll hit something. Think of it that way. So it increases your attack roll so you're more likely to hit with your sacred weapon. It also does emit bright light, which helps in act two. Um, it lasts for 10 turns and it is not a concentration ability that is one thing that i really do like about this is that it's not tied to concentration so you can layer this with the other paladin spells that do extra damage that change the damage that you do maybe to thunder or whatever it is psychic whatever whatever when you're going down to frighten things whatever choice you've got sacred weapon layers very well into the already existent paladin abilities to enchant your weapon and add more damage into it which i do love now you also get Turn the Unholy, Turn Nearby Fae and Fiends. Um, they're forced to flee, which is lovely. You will deal with probably more Fiends than Fae in this game, I will say that. And you do get Protection from Evil and Good, and then you get Sanctuary. I won't lie to you, both are kind of lackluster. I think I've only used Sanctuary at one point in Act 2 for a very specific reason and saving a very specific character. Um, but let's move down to, uh, into uh, level 5 for the Oath of Devotion. And now we're starting to get some good utility sprinkled into the Oath of Devotion. With Lesser Restoration is fine. Uh, cure from disease, poison, paralysis, or blindness. It's nice that you just kind of all, always know this, so you never have to prepare it, which is cool. But then you get Silence, which is actually quite useful. You'll be able to use a uh, circle, or a, a sphere actually, that will silence everything around them so that you can actually kind of hunt down any mages, whatever it is. It does require concentration as worth noting, but it is nice that it is an always prepared capability. Let's jump to level 7 now. And this is what gives us the Aura of Devotion. So this is going to make it so that we're immune to Charm. We're at level 10, we'll get the ability to be immune to being frightened, and we get the saving throw aura that we get as being a paladin. So you see a lot of the defensive capabilities that the aura of devotion layers in by creating a lot of status effect immunity so your characters can move freely without being locked down by charm or frightened, which are pretty common, especially in Act 3. You'll deal with a lot of stuff that frightens you, um, maybe emotionally more than actually in the game, but whatever it is. Um, <laughs> either way, too, you have just all these auras you can kick off to allow for for all this utility into your party, which is nice. Our last set of spells are at level nine, so let's take a look at those. Into level nine, though, we do have access to Beacon of Hope, so that you can maximize the amount of healing being done. They also get advantage on wisdom saving throws and death saving throws. And then lastly, remove curse. So you can remove any curses or hexes that you will deal with, maybe through the narrative or whatever it is, which you'll deal with probably a quite a bit in act two and three, depending upon how, what you do, like the, the book of the necromancy of Thay, whatever it is. So these are all of your abilities as the Paladin of Devotion. Let's bring them all together now. This time too, before we start it, we're gonna make sure we use our auras here as my voice cracks and I go through my puberty stages. These are always really important to make sure you have active. I did not show that off properly in the in the previous portion of this video, so I do encourage you to make sure that you have your auras active around your team and not just kind of on your own. Jumping into some of the battle, let's take a look at some options I've got as an Oath of Devotion Paladin here. So I have casted all my spells earlier, all my uh, fun stuff here. Um, 
you do have some cool spells that you can actually cast at level 3, like stuff like Warden of Vitality, while it's Aura Last, you can cast Restore Vitality as a bonus action to heal yourself or nearby allies. Use a bonus action to heal yourself or, near, or nearby ally, which you can use in conjunction with, um, I can't find it on here, Beacon of Hope. Your allies will gain the max hit points possible when healed. So why that's kind of nice here is they will just get 12 hit points. So you can kind of couple those things together if you want to take those kinds of layering approaches to this class. Keep in mind that this is a concentration ability. Just I've said it before so many times in this video, I'm just going to keep reiterating how important it is to remember what concentration abilities are and where they are in your game. But we talked about, too, the ability to enchant your, your weapon. So we're going to use Sacred Weapon here. And... I, I used a potion of swiftness to just keep me in the fight for this display of things, but now we have the ability to do a little bit more um, uh, uh, pizzazz here, right? We we have where is that thing? Is it not on here anymore? I don't know where it went. It, it showed up somewhere over here, and I can't find it. But now that that sacred weapon's active, we're going to have a higher likelihood to hit. I have ninety-five percent chance just to smack this thing, and my weapon you can see right there is turned on, turns into a lightsaber. So from here. That was our channel oath, right? I could have used Holy Rebuke on uh, Karlak, who's in kind of a bind, but I, I just, it's just not something that I get the most utility out of, so I don't use it. But since I always have Lesser Restoration prepared for myself, I can use this on Will over here, who is blinded. Keep in mind, though, it is a, uh, it is a melee range spell, so I have to get all the way over there to use it. I could free him up from his blindness, and then just keep kind of moving around and doing more damage. I can kind of maintain my Divine Smite, enchant it with a whole bunch of damage, and at my 95% chance to hit, I can really smack the shit out of something. Two, as well, you know, I could have used any of these concentration abilities, which I have not used, but they do require a bonus action. So maybe Thunderous Smite here, or Wrathful Smite, to add psychic damage into this to make it even more potent. All sorts of ways that can increase the damage of my weapon and increase the likelihood of it actually hitting something because of sacred weapon. So because we have extra attack, uh, let's go ahead and try this out. Oh dude, look at me, I'm gonna dunk on him. Boom, critical hit, we hit with for 18 damage. Now they do our, th these are Githyanki, so they're just pairing things left and right. So don't look at this as like, wow man, it's not really the most damage in the world I've ever seen. I'm just trying to exemplify like how these abilities can kind of come together. And boom, there we go, 12, 5, 15, both slashing, or triple of slashing, psychic, and radiant damage. And that uh, psychic is coming out from my uh, sword itself. So, you have an idea now here, in, in I'd say, less of a fashion compared to the Oath of the Ancients, right? We have so many little things you can do with the Oath of the Ancients, but Oath of Devotion wants you to get into close combat and stay there and be bulky and in the way and have you be implacable. People can't move me, you know? Like, I've got this, I'm immune to fright and immune to charge. I have a huge saving throw. Uh, my AC is through the roof and I don't even have a particularly good set of armor and gear on. This is my ranger character that I quickly just shoehorn into being a paladin. But I'm also, as far as my feet organization, goes I've gone with the heavy weapon master which is on or heavy armor master which is somewhere in here um, which is going to further reduce there it is uh, increase your strength by one and reduce incoming damage from non-magical attacks by three plus my magic my my heavy arm here armor here reduce my magical or, uh, incoming damage by two so I'm just I have so many ways to just hold the line with oath of devotion and it's not necessarily about me doing the damage it's about me absorbing it or keeping my party active and mobile and able to do things now that I'm back in range of Karlak all of these auras are back online for her so what you should look at the oath of devotion paladin is not as someone who's sitting there doling out the damage and just crushing things but allowing maybe your fighter or your barbarian to stay online longer either through utility either through being healed whatever it is that you're offering as your oath of devotion paladin it's what you're going to be doing for your party the last of the generic subclasses, excluding, of course, the Oathbreaker, is the Oath of Vengeance, the paladin that is focused most of the three on aggression and taking out the enemy. If the Oath of the Ancients is the middle ground, the Devotion is the uh, more support and tanky character, Oath of Vengeance is all about smashing things apart. And you get that action kind of turned on right away with Inquisitor's Might. You are an ally's weapon attack deals an additional three radiant damage and can daze enemies for one turn now this isn't 
absolutely amazing. But what I do like is that it does somewhat scale because this is equal to your charisma modifier. This will always be three if you're at 16 charisma or up to five once you get to 20 charisma. And the nice thing too here is that it is a bonus action, unlike the sacred weapon for the Oath of Devotion is an action, and it doesn't require concentration, it just lasts for two turns. So it's a free like three to five damage that you can just have turned on, and it's quite nice. It does require a channel oath charge, and you're probably better off using some of the other abilities, but it's nice to get out the gate here for your Oath of Vengeance. So let's jump into our level three capabilities. Vengeance is going to grant us some good spells and some nice actions. Something that I didn't really talk about with the Oath of Devotion is that the Oath of Devotion doesn't really grant you a bunch of spells that are unique. They're spells that you almost always get as a paladin already, so that's why I kind of find a little, them a little tedious by comparison to Ancients, Vengeance, or down the road when we talk about Oathbreaker. They're all out of the paladin class for the most part. Take, for example, here Hunter's Mark. Hunter's Mark is going to be nice because it's just going to give you a free 1 to 6 damage. It is a bonus action to turn on, so it's a nice thing to just to kind of have. It does require concentration, though, and you are already very crowded for concentration abilities. So keep that in mind because you don't want to kind of crowd something up. Go, oh, I'm going to put the Hunter's Mark, then go use one of my a million spells that increase damage on my weapon, which also requires concentration. Bane is nice as well, but there are a lot of ways to dole out Bane for from items that I think that using the spell itself is not as useful. And it is, again, a concentration spell. But Abjure enemy is great because you're going to be able to frighten that enemy and they'll be easier to hit and cannot move, of course, because they're frightened. And Fiends and Undead have disadvantage on the saving throw and you'll deal with a ton of Undead and a good portion of Fiends in this game. And Vow of Enmity, this is the big one here that I'd probably use over your Inquisitor's Mark, but gain advantage on attack rolls against an enemy. This is just going to help you kind of alpha strike them because it lasts for 10 turns. It's a bonus action. You pop it on them and you go to town with your weapon. This is really what you're going to be doing as a paladin, as a Vengeance Paladin. You're not going to get another aura as a Vengeance Paladin at level 7 like the other oaths do. All other oaths get auras. This character does not at level 7. Uh, they get just a generic paladin aura. Because you probably are not going to be near your party to take advantage of those auras. Or I'm sorry, your party's not going to be able to take advantage of those auras. You're going to be mobile. You're going to be moving around. You're going to be hunting things down. Level 5 is going to give us two more really good strong spells. Hold Person is a very good one. It's very good. You probably have access to this on a number of other classes, but it's just a great spell to have if you don't, because it just allows you to do a ton of damage to something, because you're basically just locking them out completely, because um, when they are held, they cannot move, take action, bonus action, or reaction, and attacks against sanity are always crit hits. It's stupid strong. It's probably one of the stronger CCs in the game. In addition to, we're going to get access to Misty Step, which is a bonus action, and it's just going to give you like a pretty much a free 60-foot movement. You just jump wherever the hell you want. It's very good. And of course, you get your extra attack, which makes it even better here at level 5. So in lieu of an aura at 7, you get Relentless Avenger. If you hit an enemy with an opportunity attack, your movement speed increases by 15 feet on your next turn. How you can really kind of play around with this is actually using your feats. So let's jump into here to level eight and let's take a look at some of our feat options here because if you take a look at Polar Master, you also make it an opportunity attack when a target comes within range. So if you're using glaives, halberds, quarter staves, or spears, this is a really awesome way to use Relentless Avenger to just kind of stack things up for you. And you couple this with Polar Master and Sentinel. So Sentinel, you gain advantage on opportunity attacks. And when you hit a creature with an opportunity attack, it can no longer move for the rest of the turn. This is just kind of how you can really layer these together to get a lot of really cool, fun punching power with the, vent, the Oath of Vengeance Paladin and that Relentless Avenger, right? Your movement speed increases by 15 feet on your next turn. You can really use this mobility because like I said before, the Oath of Vengeance Paladin is very much about using that mobility. Speaking of mobility, we'll get to talk about our level nine spells with haste. Target yourself or an ally, become hastened, gain an action, become faster and harder to hit. It is real nice. It is a concentration ability. So, you know, you always got to keep that in mind. Um, and you also get protection from energy. It's going to help you get acid, cold, fire, lightning, or thunder. Let's put all this together to show off what that vengeance can do.
before jumping into the actual fight too, we'll turn on our auras like we do. And one thing I've actually saved to talk about in this section is the way your weapon enchantments are really going to be working. And with aura or uh, with the Vengeance Paladin, I would argue that it's very strong and worthwhile to get them going for yourself before jumping into combat. And it's really how you should be using them, period, right? Like this magic weapon, this lasts until long rest. I have to maintain concentration on it, which is going to be tedious, but still it's really worth it. Or here, you know, elemental weapon, imbue a weapon with an elemental power, or sees plus one to bonus, bonus to attack rolls, and deals an additional 1d4 damage of your choice. So making sure you get one of these turned on for yourself is going to be pretty crucial before you even jump into the fight. Just like I've said, it is a concentration ability, so keep those things in mind. Or if you want to do something like this and turn it into a fire weapon or a thunder weapon, whatever it is, here just to kind of show off this real fast go ahead and do that so do these things before you jump into a fight especially when you're playing a vengeance paladin because you're going to be ripping and gripping across the field you might as well have this active and try to do as much damage as you can jumping into combat we've got some wild stuff going on that we can do with a vengeance paladin so we can go ahead and cast haste on ourselves to move around a little bit quicker here i've got a potion of speed going but what i want to really make sure you know about abjure enemy is that it is a wisdom save that the enemy is going to make so on a save, the target is slowed instead, and they'll be easier to hit and cannot move, of course. Um, that, that's what I'm sorry. It hap you frighten an enemy, they'll be easier to hit and cannot move, but on a save, rather than frightened, they're slowed. So their movement speed is halved, taking damage in this condition. So they don't get the benefit of being frightened, which would otherwise give you... Um, uh, a little bit of an advantage when attacking them, right? Frightened enemies also have disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls. So it would be easier for you to hit them overall. So Abjure Enemy, if I want to use this on this Githyanki over here who has a ton of wisdom, 35% resistance. 40 or 30% right here. 40% right here. So just kind of keep those things in mind. Maybe you hit a certain situation where you're like, you know what, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense here. Maybe I'm not going to go with Abjure Enemy, whatever it is. But... Conversely, Vow of Enmity does not have an associated saving throw. So I'm going to just go ahead and choose a character. Ooh, I'll go ahead. I got to get 10 feet. I got to be 10 feet away from them. So we'll move over here. Choose someone to Vow of Enmity on. And there we go. So now all my attacks have advantage on this character, which is lovely, right? Otherwise, I would, it would have been way harder for me to hit. So I can turn off my passive here. Give me the ability to really pour on, well, increase my likelihood to hit. So let's just go ahead and even, we'll layer in the, the might of a level 3 Divine Smite, even though it's an overkill, this guy's only got 28 health, I got 58% chance to hit, so there's a chance this doesn't even go off. And it went off just smokingly. But I get extra attack, and I've got a lot of things I can do here still. So we can stay within range of something and kind of keep ourselves open for a opportunity attack if they go ahead and move within range of me. But I just want to show off some more damage we can do. Oh, they parried it. Those sons of bitches. But you know what? We have an extra attack. We'll go ahead and use that. Oh, of course. Why, why wouldn't they miss? And I mean, in a, in a perfect world, this would have been a ton of cascading damage I would have done. Um, even surprisingly, I didn't, I didn't get as much of the, that, that going on here, but still, nonetheless, you can see that now on the next turn, if anyone moves, my opportunity attacks are going to become a little disgusting, right? Because I've gone with Polar Master. So I'm gonna ha it's going to allow me that if they move within range of that little circle around me, I'm going to be able to do my opportunity attack on them. And with my Relentless Avenger as well, I'm going to be able to move further that next turn. This adds to that mobility. Maybe on my next turn too, I'm using Misty Step just to really get in someone's face and just pour pee all over them. Maybe I jump into haste and maybe this allows me to kind of keep things going a little bit here. Whatever it is. Remember, someone that is someone that is hastened. Creature has plus two bonus to armor class, advantage on dex throws, its movement speed is doubled, and it takes one additional action per turn. That's basically your potion of speed. So you're getting you got that in your pocket now all the time, which is absolutely lovely. Lovely. So those are some of the things that you're doing as a vengeance paladin. You are mobile, you are getting around, you are focusing down a target at a time. Typically, when you're gonna be using 
uh, this vow of enmity, you're choosing the hardest target in in the lot and focusing it down. Uh, in this case, this character was probably the one that I wanted to kill the fastest because it had some pretty deadly abilities. So I focused it down. That's what you do with Vengeance. You are just able to dish out a ton of damage. Now, this doesn't mean you can only dish out to one damage to one target and be kind of a limp noodle after that. You still are someone that can just deliver the noise should you see fit. And it's worth noting, too, something I haven't talked about is that Divine Smite is a reaction. That you, or you can have it as a reaction here for crit hits and stuff like that. So you can use Divine Smite in a lot of different ways that are not just simply pressing the button and attacking with it. You have your Polearm Master opportunity attack here. And if you, get, if you get a crit hit off of an opportunity attack, you can trigger your Divine Smite. So keep these things in mind because it allows Vengeance to really have exploding damage if you're mindful about the way you approach this class and how you can get this damage on board. It's time for the last one, the Oath Breaker. You have broken your oath in whatever level or act you've chosen, and it converts your paladin at its current point in the game over to Oathbreaker. You don't, it's not like a multi-class, it's not like you retain anything from the previous oath you had or anything like that. Basically, all the levels you've invested into another oath eventually, uh, um, uh, instantaneously convert into Oathbreaker. So, you can see that we've just completed the Oathbreaker kind of... It's not a quest line, but once you break your oath, you go through a little process. And we can take a look at all what we get. So the first thing here is Spiteful Suffering. The target takes 1 to 4 necrotic damage each turn, and attack rolls against it have advantage. This right here is a channel oath charge. And we have two other channel oath abilities here. Control Undead, use the power of your oath to gain control over an undead creature. The undead will follow you around and attack your enemies, which is actually quite nice considering how much undead you do deal with in the game. Then you have Dreadful Aspect. Let your darkest emotions burst forth as a menacing pulse to frighten nearby enemies. So this is a 30-foot radius, two-turn Frighten, which is actually very nice. And then we get Aura of Hate. Aura of Hate is... is I don't know, maybe, maybe it's my personal preference, but I think it's the best aura as far as the the uh, subclass-specific auras go. You and your any nearby fiends and undead gain an additional 3 to damage with melee weapons. This aura disappears if you fall unconscious. This 3 to damage is based off of your strength modifier. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, your charisma modifier, your charisma modifier. And this will go up, so you can have this be a plus 5 if it were. And the nice thing is that this is just a flat damage bonus there's no discrepancies there's no a one to four there's no a this there's no a that there's no a damage there's no damage type affixed to this it's just a three damage or four or five damage outright so it's nice to just kind of have a flat solid bonus that is not resistible sometimes you can say hey you know what this is going to give us necrotic damage and this thing might actually be um, resistant to necrotic damage or maybe it's radiant damage and they're resistant to radiant damage in fact i I'll be honest, I don't think anything in the game that I can think of offhand so far is resistant to radiant damage. So that's, I guess that's neither here nor there. But those are your big actions that come with the Oathbreaker. And in addition to that too, you get some spells. Some of them are great, some are not so awesome. Hellish Rebuke is actually pretty fun. Uh, the reason I like it is, is that it's a reaction. So whenever someone hits you, you react and you get to blast them with fire. And you can change the level of the spell slot you use on this. This actually can become quite strong. Now the only problem with this is, is that you are a paladin. And a paladin does like to use their spell slots for divine smites and other kind of tricky tricks so this you kind of have to think of it in mind of hey you lose a potential divine smite if you choose this but at the same time you get a very strong return hit if you charge this with a level two or three even just a level one spell um inflict wounds is okay i think it looks really cool on paper but it's never that awesome uh you have crown of madness here which is lovely darkness which is a really really good spell of course remember it doesn't uh, give blindness so disadvantage on attack rolls range of attacks and spells reduced to 10 feet and attack rolls against blinded creatures have advantage so you can get a lot of really great things on online when you blind things and you're attacking them from far or up close and personal 
And our last two things are bestow curse. So curse a creature with your touch. The curse either bestows disadvantage on checks and saving throws or attacks, lets you deal additional damage to the target, or robs it of its actions. So it's got a lot of really fun applications. Just keep in mind that it is a concentration spell. So if you use it and you want to say maybe use any of your weapon imbuements, anything like that, you will use lose those um, imbuements. Then lastly, though, you do get animate dead. Create an undead servant from a corpse. So if you carry corpses, around if you're playing with a necromancer as well you can kind of have you both getting a lot of benefits out of aura of hate here uh because you gain you and any nearby fiends and undead so if you have anyone who's got um is it planar binding uh, there, there's a uh, maybe it's not called summon fiend but there is a summon fiend capability that certain clerics certain wizards certain druids and so on and so forth can get access to this is going to buff those said fiends um and i believe also uh if you're a warlock with your pact of the chain and you go with an imp uh that is a fiend but getting uh this buff online is very good so now we've talked a little bit about the the oath breaker let's kind of see some of this stuff in action so with the Oathbreaker, one of the big things we're going to do, even before we jump into combat, is get ready with our animate dead. <clears throat> so this character, or this this little guy, is going to, is going to last us for um, as long as until they die. So we have a choice. We have an option here between animate dead skeleton and animate dead zombie. And the preference is going to be the difference between choosing a melee combatant in the zombie or a ranged combatant in the skeleton. Now, without trying to spoil a bunch of stuff in the game... If you're going to go Oathbreaker, or Necromancy Wizard for that matter, you should complete the Necromancy of Thay book that you get in Act 1 that will conclude in Act 3. That is all I will say. And that might change some things here. So, before we do that, we have to have a corpse. So this is going to be kind of a, a big play style with the Oathbreaker if you do choose this, is having a corpse that in some way, shape, or form you can animate. So picking up corpses, putting it on someone that can actually hold these corpses is going to be crucial. So let's just go ahead and animate dead zombie. And then from this point is when we would do any kind of buffing that we would want to do with the zombie. So take for example here Will, we're going to go ahead and cast Long Strider on the zombie. So now I can move further. And on my main character here, I'm going to cast my Aura of Hate. And now I take a look at our zombie. He has that Aura of Hate. Deals an additional three damage because remember it's based off of our Charisma. Now another thing that's based off our Charisma that I didn't, didn't get a chance to show is Spiteful Suffering. Does get a bonus from your Charisma. So do kind of keep that in mind. We're going to activate any other Auras if we see fit right here as well and one last thing before jumping in is of course and I, i've talked about this more with uh the vengeance paladin but if i do want to do any kind of weapon enchantment it's probably better to do it now and remember it is a concentration ability so if i use something like this i wouldn't be able to use searing smite because it is a concentration spell right deal an additional damage and set your target on fire it target the target then takes uh, fire damage every turn so i'm just going to choose magic weapon here for the sake of what i'm trying to say um, I, could, I could cast it higher to make it do, um, you see, casting this spell using a 4th or 5th level spell slot increases the bonus by 2, and a 6th level spell slot will increase it by 3. So you can see that that does have additional bonuses if I see fit. And then it pops up here in the lower left, even though it's not up here in my, my character. It's again represented. When I hover over, you can see that additional weapon enchantment plus 1 right there. So that's all the kind of pre-stuff I've done with the Oathbreaker. Let's jump into combat and see how this all kind of unfold. So in combat with the Oathbreaker, we can do a lot of fun different things. We can have some, well, fun while doing them. Taking a look at our zombie first, don't look at this guy as someone who's going to be doing a ton of ridiculous stuff. Kind of think of it more in the lines of, um, I guess like an easy comparison would be something like the Shadow Knight from EverQuest. Like this is not, you're, you're not a necromancer. You're not someone who's summoning up fields of the undead. If you cast Animate Dead at level 4, you get three ghouls, not just one. And if you cast at level 5 and 6, you get the chances for flying ghouls and stuff like that. So different ghouls. So necromancers get a ton of pets when they use Animate Dead. It's not the case for you. This character is more meant to supplement and attack things and divert damage away from you as an Oathbreaker. It's more of a supplement to your character and less of an actual kind of damage point. And with this little ghoul, we have its slam capability that has Crawling Gnaw. So if something dies that is infected with the Crawling Gnaw, it rises again as a zombie. If the affected unit entity dies before the infection wears off, it will temporarily rise again as a newborn zombie. 
And it's worth noting too that the newborn zombie zombie is not the most durable. It will take damage every turn, one necrotic damage until it dies. But it will follow around the, the parent zombie that attacked it. So it's kind of a cool way to kind of have exploding zombies. You have this guy go and attack a low health thing or you have it at least get a bite in on something your guy about, is about to alpha strike and you get all the benefits of it kind of raising more zombies. And it does also have internal uh, undead fortitude. So it's going to, even though it's got 22 hit points, if something were to do 48 damage to it, it would still come back to life with one hit point. So you have that kind of capability too. And again, it's just really meant to tie things up so they can't move, they can't do certain things, whatever it is. Don't think of it as something that's going to be doing the majority of your damage. And as far as the things that you can do as an Oathbreaker, we got a lot here. So let's say, you know, this is our hard target. This is the thing we really want to take out. Well, Spiteful Suffering is very good. So the target's going to take damage each turn that it activates. And attack rolls against it have advantage. So this is already a great way for you to layer damage on because you're getting the innate bonus of your... Aura of Hate, which is going to give you just a flat damage bonus, and whatever hard target you're focusing on, very similar to the Oath of Vengeance, you're going to have an advantage on. 4-7 to seven Necrotic Damage isn't wild for sure, but still, it's nice to kind of turn on an advantage capability. Let me go ahead and press this. Also to Control Undead, which we have already talked about. So if we were fighting Undead in this fight, I'd just be able to control one, and my Aura of Hate would help it out. Dreadful Aspect lets your dark, darkest emotions burst forth, and a menacing pulse of frightened things. So... The, this is actually a very good spell because of the effects of um, CCs and Frightens in, in 5th edition and in Dungeons and Dragons. It, just kind of keep in mind, though, that this is a wisdom save. So in this, in this specific fight, and this is the same fight that we've showcased for every single oath, it's not going to be awesome, right? Because all these characters have stupid high wisdom, or at least wisdom saves to the point where this is not really going to help them or uh, hurt them because they have something that's going to negate, frighten, whatever it is. But in a lot of the fights that you're going to deal with in the game, this is still going to be very good for you, especially in Act 1 where you're dealing with tons of goblins. So those are just your, your kind of generic capabilities you've got. So let's go ahead and just use Spiteful Suffering just to kind of, well, it's a 0% chance. Of course it is. Why wouldn't it be? Why wouldn't it be anything less than 0%? Um, I guess we'll just do try try to get that one off. All right, well it's saved. Whatever, we've learned our lesson. We won't be doing it. And then from here, we're really going to be taking advantage of all the same abilities that we've had as a paladin up to this point, right? We can go for a very particularly heavy slam here with a real deadly 20, 29 to seventy damage coming out from my weapon because my weapon now has a plus one enchantment onto it, and we've upcasted it here. If I were level eleven or level twelve, level eleven. Um, this would be an improved smite, and we'd get an additional free 1d8, so this would be doing even more damage here. Or we could just swing for the fences. Um, I happen to have this really good weapon, so I've got this cool Grand Slam ability that can just kind of shoot things around. But let's do a... Um, nope, 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 nope. Let's do this one. And you can see the Oathbreaker smite looks a little bit different, right? Which is pretty sweet. Parried it, and we can just kind of keep wombo comboing those together if we've got the spell charges to do so. And it's just a very fun thing. Of course, of course, I'd miss for the pretense of this video, right? But still. Um, you can see here that this oath seems like it's like, okay, how am I really going to layer these things together? But you're doing a lot of really strong alpha striking with the capabilities of Spiteful Suffering. You're able to have a little companion here that's going to be able to get in and maybe do some just like BS damage here and there. I mean, it doesn't have any kind of bonus attack or anything like that, but at the same time, I could leave this engagement and still tie this person up so they have to deal with or be threatened by this zombie. This is a great thing for any kind of ranged or, or casting character to kind of just go tie them up. And you have all of your other really cool auras that you can take advantage of, especially Aura of Hate, helping out any kind of fiend and undead play. What I will say with the Oathbreaker is, it's really fun. It's very strong. Uh, I think people are kind of... I think a lot of people think as far as pure damage goes, it's between Oathbreaker or Vengeance, depending on how you want to play your Paladin. But if you play an Oathbreaker Paladin with a Necromancer, it is a really fun, really stupid combination. Especially, it's a super thematic one, too. And you have a lot of fun playing with all the animate dead capabilities that you've got, mainly on the Necromancer that you then supplement as a uh, an Oathbreaker. But it is a very, very fun set of playthroughs. My good buddy Remortis has a whole big video on animate dead and how it really plays into Baldur's Gate 3 as well as 5th edition. You can find that linked in the description below. But this is your Oathbreaker Paladin 
for Baldur's Gate 3. And at that, it brings our video here to a close. So you've got all four of your major Paladin Oaths. And just to kind of recap here, let's go through them all very quickly um, at a high level. And you've got your Oath of the Ancients, which sits very heavily in between a pure support oath and a more damage centric oath you have a lot of very fun really good supplemental spells that can do a lot of really fun capabilities for you you have a really good healing in your channel oath capabilities and you have a lot of good damage that you can outpour because of the spells you have active or because of your auras and the defensive capabilities that they grant you then on the actual defensive end of the spectrum we have the oath of de devotion the character that's kind of sitting as the the tried and true paladin the 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 knight in shining armor the one that i think really fits well as not a character dealing damage but taking damage sitting in the middle of everything and forcing it to really deal with that character you can use and i you know i didn't even talk about it at all in the video but compelled duel forces an enemy to attack only you giving it disadvantage against other targets so you can use that for the oath of devotion and try and sprinkle that out onto a really hard target so to make sure that it focuses you and has to burn you down you're using all of your auras too that really kind of add some complementary stuff to it now i didn't want to talk about it throughout the video because i like to try to make my videos positive i don't want you to think that you've made the wrong choice or anything like that but i do want to say that the oath of devotion the one thing i do i kind of bring brought this up a little bit the only thing i think that really is a letdown for it is the fact that it's spells that it gets access to as an oath spell meaning they're always prepared of course it's a little lackluster because they're almost always spells you already get so I, I, it's just one of the biggest problems i have and that it's oath um god what the, the rebuke capability it, it's it's innate action doesn't scale with you i wish it did it, it it's, it's too unfortunate that it does into our last one here our last standard one we have the oath of vengeance which is your pure damage oath that's focused on hunting things down mobility that kind of selfish damage versus the um party centric or or buffing capabilities of the previous two oaths and lastly we have the oath breaker that if we're talking selfish they are truly truly selfish right they are focused on raising the dead and and, and it's something i did not bring up in the in the oath breaker section is you can raise the dead in the middle of the fight so if you didn't use your animate dead coming into it, you can just kind of continue to use it and bring them back online and have those undead springing around and doing damage for you or tying things up, whatever it is. But the Oathbreaker 2 is one that is going to sit in a very interesting kind of playthrough for you. You've broken your tenets. You sit outside the kind of quote unquote law and you're doing either good or evil in whatever way you see fit. And hopefully you can see the, the O spells kind of play very well with the style of play that the channel oath and capabilities of the oath bringer bring to the table so hopefully now all after looking at all four of these oaths you have a good idea of which one you want to play which character you want for your paladin are you defensive are you a party or <laughs> are you a party bro um are you a damage dealer whatever one that fits the character you have in mind is truly the best oath not one of these is any better than the others because it's going to come down to what you want to do in your playthrough of Baldur's Gate 3. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one. Take care. And if you have any suggestions or anything like that for any of these oaths, please let it be known in the comment section below. But again, have a good one and take care.